Okay, so when my career began, my first five or ten years of field collecting, um, when you wanted to add that geographic reference to your field notebook, you gave the hierarchical textual description. I'm in Cameroon, I'm in Southwest region, I'm in this district, I'm, in, I'm five kilometers north of Buea, okay? And then when you got back home, you would search out the best map series that you could find, and you would do your very best to assign a latitude-longitude coordinate pair to that site, okay? And you would bring along an altimeter, which would help you with kind of finer level determination. But of course, the altimeter would get messed up when a storm front would come in and change the barometric pressure. And I have to say, you know, in the mid 80s, there were points where my colleagues and I dreamed of someday, you know, being able to look at something that looks like a wristwatch and see the latitude and longitude. And here we are just 30 years later, and you can do exactly that. So, um, how precise are G GPS units? How precise? Can I tell the difference between my position and Kate's position? About four meters. Four meters. Okay. Anybody else have a number? Seven? Okay, so that's the lowest uncertainty that you've seen on your screen. Three meters, okay. So we want to test that idea, and that's most of what we'll do in this exercise. Um, in reality, this is, a, this is a satellite network that the US military put up. And surprisingly, they opened some level of access to it back when there were serious worries about, you know, essentially exactly where is the White House or exactly where is whatever. Um, and so until uh, the presidency of Bill Clinton, the best accuracy that was possible was on the order of 100 meters. And apparently, during the Clinton presidency, it was realized that, that latitude and longitude could be measured more precisely. Uh, and it was essentially a, a ridiculous situation to be clouding the, uh, the GPS signals. And so they removed that, that filtering. And the accuracy is now in theory, around 10 meters, but I want to test that, okay? I want you to test that. So, let's talk about this. We want a full, accurate, precise, repeatable description of any place on Earth, right? That's what we really want. It has to be pretty fine-grained, pretty precise, has to be accurate without bias, but it also has to be repeatable, because I want to be able to click my GPS unit and say later to Eric, Eric, I found this really neat moth right at this latitude-longitude pair, and he should be able to go back to that same place. That's repeatability, right? Now, first question is what numbers do we use? And as Kate said, we usually use the World Geodetic System, WGS, and its most recent full version is 1984. There have been some updates since 1984, but essentially the standard for latitude and longitude is WG WGS 1984. Okay, standard coordinate system for the Earth, standard spheroidal reference surface um, for raw altitude data, Blah, blah, blah. Okay? Now, definitely some countries or regions or projects 
will have other coordinate systems. And the most common are, are in units of meters, okay, and they're called uh, Universal Transverse Mercator, uh, so UTMs. Um, and you can immediately tell if somebody gives you a coordinate pair and it's not WGS, because usually it will be in units of meters and so it'll be numbers that are in the millions or billions, okay? But especially if somebody gives you coordinate data in UTM formats, you need a lot more information. Because imagine if you tried to give the position of any place on Earth using a meter coordinate system. If you're in China or if you're in Cameroon or if you're in the Southwest Pacific, those numbers are going to be huge, okay? And so UTMs are referred to kind of regional reference points. So uh, you really have to document those, that reference point very carefully. And it's essentially a series of numbers that give you exactly which uh, UTM system you're in. If you don't document that, guess what? Incremental data loss. That may cause uh, bias by tens of meters or even tens of kilometers. So this question, you know, my, my career goes back to the 80s, but it goes farther, much farther back than that. If you have time and can get a copy of it, I recommend this book. It's just called Longitude. And it's essentially about, I can't read it, but um, it's essentially about the challenge that dominated early exploration of the Earth as um, not just European, but European, American, uh, and even Oriental uh, voyagers were starting to move around the Earth. And essentially the challenge was that latitude was pretty easy. There's several ways that you can measure latitude without any instrumentation. But longitude was brutally hard, okay? So essentially for latitude, uh, any star will consistently reach the same highest point in the sky. Its height in the sky changes with the observer's latitude. Uh, so for example, in the northern hemisphere, the north star called Polaris is a popular choice. The angle that the North Star makes with the horizon is the same as the observer's latitude. So if you know your constellations well enough, you simply find the maximum uh, elevation, the maximum angle that the North Star makes with the horizon, and in theory you can get a pretty precise latitude. You can also use the angle of the sun. There's several options available to you. Longitude's pretty bad. So, because one day is 24 hours long, one can easily use time to calculate longitude. One hour of time difference corresponds to 15 degrees of longitude, which is essentially 360 degrees divided by 24 hours. So suppose an observer sets his or her accurate watch to 12 noon Green Greenwich, England, and then travels some long distance. If the observer notices that the sun is highest in the sky at four, according to that same watch, which has been completely true and accurate, the observer know, then knows that he or she is at longitude 60 degrees west. Four hours times 15 degrees per hour, 60 degrees. So it's easy if you have a clock, okay? And what that book is about is about the challenge of making a clock that could stay reasonably accurate for months and on a ship that's doing this and in varying conditions of humidity, et cetera, et cetera. And that was a major impediment to marine navigation until quite recently. And now look at us, right? I mean, literally, we have that magic watch that I wanted all the way through graduate school. So how does this work? Okay, so 
the GPS satellite system is this network of satellites that are circling the Earth. And essentially, you have fairly uniform coverage all the way around the surface of the Earth. I'm sure military applications involve other satellites that are more focused over certain parts of the Earth. And you guys can imagine what some of those parts of the Earth are. So essentially, what's happening is that each satellite is sending out a time signal. You know, 3 o'clock. 3.01, 3.02. And you might be sitting here, or you might be sitting there, and your GPS unit is receiving those time signals. But given that those signals take a non-zero amount of time to travel from a high satellite orbit to the surface of the Earth, it takes slightly longer, for example, for this satellite for its signal to get there than this satellite. And so the, the GPS unit is using a triangulation that looks like this. And this is why Kate said, make sure you have four satellites. OK? Imagine, this is, this is just kind of a, a, a makeup, you know, made up example. Um, imagine we have two satellites, and this one is a little bit farther away than this one. And so we can look at their signals and find where they intersect. And they're going to inter intersect in two places. OK? But this does imagine that our, our timekeeping is perfect. And so if you had maybe a second of difference, a very small difference, then you can get error introduced into your measurement of position. But if you had a third site, those can only intersect in one place, those three circles, OK? So there's a lot more detail to this, and, and I, don't, I can't say that I understand it all perfectly. But that's the general uh, point of view. With three satellites, you can get a fairly accurate horizontal position. But you should always mistrust the vertical position. And in fact, those elevations that you get off of a GP GPS unit are a bit more suspect than the latitude and longitude. So I want to take you to the city where Rafe and Kate and Jacob and Mark and I live. Um, this is Lawrence, Kansas. Um, I also want to show you this site. It's called OpenStreetMap. Um, you probably know Google Maps. Okay, really cool. You can type in an address here in Boya, and it'll show you right where it is. And it'll probably even give you directions to get there. But the data underlying Google Maps are not available. Strictly not available. Google is making a lot of money off of that. So this initiative began, and it's called OpenStreetMap. And it's essentially crowdsourcing mapping the streets of the world. And so not only can you zoom in and explore, just like with Google Maps, but you can also, look at this, export. OK? And I can do that. I did that for Buea, for Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, you can do that for your city, you know, anywhere you want to map of. Obviously, in the city, you have more uh, kind of base information. So Lawrence lies right along this interstate highway, which is Interstate 70. The main street of Lawrence is Massachusetts Street, which is this. We have a big, ugly reservoir west of us called Clinton Lake. Um, some wetlands south of the city. It all used to be uh, prairie, but fire has been controlled. And so now it's mostly treed, but it's a very ugly forest. Um, there's an old army ammunitions plant that apparently is quite toxic. Nobody goes there. Um, and so I drew a box around the, the latitude and longitude ranges that I wanted. 
I hit um, export. I noticed that I was licensed under a Open Data Commons Open Database license. I don't know anything about that license, but I was able to export the data, so I really didn't care. I'm not going to publish any of this stuff. But probably if I were going to publish it, I should look at the license and see if I'm allowed to. I think I am. And look at this. Now I'm in QGIS. And that's the segment of Lawrence that I wanted to export. And you can do this for Boya. I just did it for Boya. So then um, my GPS unit arrived in the mail just a bit before this course. And so I obviously did not read the owner's manual. Never ever do that. Instead, I turned it on and put it on my dining room table. And there's my house. Okay, so for Dave and Rafe and Kate, that's Massachusetts Street, that's New Hampshire Street, that's Doug Compton's Hotel, and that is uh, Rhode Island Street, and that's my house. Okay? And if we're looking at it, you know, from, through Caleb's eyes, it's a dot. Right? But let's go in a little bit closer. Does it still look like a dot, Caleb? How's that? <coughs> Okay, so I measured and this distance is about 40 meters. But I want you to see where my GPS unit was during all of that time. During all of those measurements, my GPS unit did not move a centimeter. Okay, this is other stuff that I needed for this trip. Um, but that's where the GPS unit was while it was recording all of those data. And so if we look in Google Earth, that's now a big hotel that I hate. That's the Lawrence Arts Center. Here is uh, New ha uh, Rhode Island Street. And this is my house. Again, it used to be prairie, but nobody's burned downtown Lawrence since the US Civil War. Uh, so that's my house and you can see that's, that's our kitchen. My bedroom is right about there. So that dining room table is there. Okay? Now, there are those points. Some of those points placed my dining room table. No, no, the hotel isn't, wasn't built when this imagery was here. This is the Lawrence Arts Center. But you can see that's not three meters or 10 meters. That's, it's 40 meters. So, here's exercise number one. It is the simplest GPS exercise possible. I was going to want you to put your GPS units right there, but I guess this building may have a metal roof, so we're not getting very good signal in here. So let's go out into the parking lot. Everybody who has a GPS unit, turn it on. but I want them all within one meter of each other. Turn it on, wait till you have a ton of satellites, wait till it blinks and says I've got coordinates, and then write down the coordinates. So now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven GPS measurements of the same place, which is right outside in the, in the parking lot. Um, I'm going to take these into QGIS and put them on a base map of Boya streets. However, what I would like you to do while I'm doing this is I'd like you to think about, I'd like you to think about a little bit more information. So, a projection and a datum, okay? So a projection is, you know, the Earth is three-dimensional. It's essentially like a ball that's being stepped on. It's a little shorter than it is fat. Um, and yet we want to show these, show the Earth as a, oh, 
I see a problem all of a sudden. Um, anyhow, we want to show the Earth on a two-dimensional surface. And so somehow we have to flatten the Earth. So um, imagine you're taking the peel off of an orange and imagine you've got to flatten that out, right? You can flatten it by stretching the peel near the poles and compressing it near the equator. Or you could, you could flatten it by ripping it in different places, okay? And some things that you do will affect uh, shapes, some things will affect distances, some things will affect area, and some things will affect direction. So essentially a projection is something we do to be able to look at a map. So that's not quite what we want here. Um, I actually have the wrong image up above, but 